Oh, it was right. That's right. Thanks, Colin. Uh, so this is a, to to somehow safeguard the genetic information against the environment. You put it into its center. In some sense, is the idea here and. Today, as I said, we talk about the cell wall, the cell wall being built up of a double layer of lipids. And you already see in this one here, you have flagella, so you have parts of the cell that stick out, or you don't see anything else. The other point about eukaryotic cells, there's another part of substructure, and actually many of these substructures, those here are, happen to be the mitochondria. This will not be part of the exam, and this is part of a different lecture, but just the idea eukaryote, prokaryote, not wrong to take home. Uh, and you have these subcompartments, and the subcompartments inside of a eukaryote, how do you believe they are formed? So how do they distinguish themselves? So one is here the nucleus, right? How, does, how, how would you distinguish the, the nucleus, or what would, put, would you do in order to have the nucleus not part? If you imagine the whole thing like a soup, it's a little bit wrong, like a sack of water or something like that. And then how do you shield the inside here of that outside of the inside of the cell? What would you do? What would you put around the nucleus? Any idea? Exactly, it's the same, same story again. You put lipids around. Uh, so in this particular case, they have their own li uh, membrane, correct? And that is true for all these compartments. These are the mitochondria. Um, in fact, mitochondria, another note here on the side, uh, mitochondria are assumed to be uh, relics of a bacterial intake. So essentially, my, my mitochondria are bacteria that were put into eukaryotes, and eukaryotes carry since that, uh, since some uh, time point, a long, long time ago. Uh, they do n carry also genetic information, but there's very little genetic information in here. Uh, this codes, so the nucleus of the smallest eukaryote carries about 6,000 genes, that's yeast, uh, while these here carry in the ballpark of 20. So this is much, much less. Nevertheless, and again, I'm, I'm sort of leaving the story of membrane proteins. I'm talking about something that is not really relevant for the lecture. Uh, but when FBI does sequencing or fingerprinting, typically what they target are mitochondria. It's mitochondrial DNA. Although there is so little, the mitochondria are passed on to you from the mother. Uh, the, the genome, as you know, is a mix. And that is purely from the mother. The, the important issue here is that you have hundreds of mitochondria in a cell. So you have very few genes in there, but a lot of the copies. So it's very simple to get that material out. That's the only reason why there's a little material. You can easily isolate the few genes that are markers for who you are. Uh, and you have a lot of material. It's very easy to do. That's as simple as that. Uh, okay. Back to the mem membrane proteins and the cell membrane. When we ask about the localization of drug targets, so drug targets are simply the proteins that are targeted by all the drugs on the market. And the answer to that is almost 60% of those are membrane. Uh, and some other fraction are sort of related to this, and some of these here, in fact, are also mem membrane inserted uh, proteins. Any idea why that could be the case? Why are membrane proteins so relevant for, for drugs? Maybe because it's easier to access them. You just have to get in one That's one important thing. There's another thing. Uh, it allows the passage of uh, yeah. uh, components from outside into the cells. So exactly. It's a, it's a major gateway. Just, again, a lot of the cell is, in some sense, the image of this medieval castle or something like that. You put a wall around it, and the first point of attack will be the gate. You will try to get some guys into, into this uh, city through the gate. And in some sense, that's exactly the, the story. It's easy to reach. It's the central point of communication inside and outside. Uh, and in fact, that is also always the first attack of a virus, for instance, of a bacterium. Um, here are some uh, drugability rules. I will not get into that. Um, and, oops. Let's get back to, again, membrane proteins. Most membrane proteins are alpha helical. Let me just show you a bunch of these. What I 
do not show here, what you see are the proteins. What you do not see is the lipid bilayer. Because the lipid bilayer you do not see in the crystal. It is indicated here by, well, by the line, no, the lines are out of, of focus here. Uh, you can essentially, whenever you, you see this sort of mushroomy thing, and you imagine that you squeeze, right? The part that is squeezed is the part that is in the membrane. So you see it here. You see? This is all the part that is in the membrane. The same here, and where sort of the mushroom grows out and, and looks different. Here, in the, okay, here is not, this is not squeezed, this is narrower. But still, you see this is sort of like a wild growth, if, if you want. And then exactly here, where the wild growth here and here begin is where the membrane bilayer ends and begins, right? Uh, and in between you have what in a little bit more detail you may see here are helices. The helices mo essentially, here's an extreme clear example, go orthogonal through the membrane. So if just this rod inserted, uh, here are example. And you may immediately see by now that the way they differ is that there are different numbers of helices. So somehow visually you see it by the density. In some cases you see the helices. Very few here, more here, a lot of them. In some cases they form a pore. Uh, but here are more, uh, more clearly shown this, this cylinder rods. Uh, here is a case where we have a pore-like formation, so you have some, some large construct here that recognizes substrates and that in fact then will sort of open or close this, this, this part here. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm just... Um, okay, now same story again, here the lipid bilayer, here in this particular case uh, the pore that I showed you before. Okay, uh, and again some of them are huge, the cytochrome shown here, the BC complex. Um, and again, so there are parts here that are in the membrane, parts that are outside of the membrane. When I ask how much of the membrane proteins can we do with comparative modeling? And the answer is, say, this is all the membrane proteins that we have, and this blue is the fraction of those that we can model. Why is that, do you believe? Comparative modeling, as we just briefly explained, is a technique that, in fact, maps proteins of unknown structure to proteins of known, experimentally known structures. Why will that could that go so wrong for memory proteins? What could be the reason for that? It's very simple. We just don't have enough experimental structures of those. And that means that we cannot map it to many, many uh, examples. And remember, I showed you previously the, the view on Swiss prot, the view on a genome, how much I can do comparative modeling for normal protein, for non membrane proteins, globular water soluble. And I told you that if you just wait, comparative, the power of comparative modeling increases. If you do the same for membrane proteins, you see that not much changes. Simply because we don't know if enough experimental structures. And that is simply because it's so complicated to, to, to get them. The reason why it's so complicated to get them ultimately is they are too large for NMR. Most membrane proteins are more than 200 residues. NMR cannot handle, typically cannot handle proteins longer than 200 residues. And for crystallography, the problem is that you have to take them out of the membrane and in order to crystallize. But they are, they need the membrane environment. And in the membrane, so there are example, examples of some proteins, and some of those I showed you, where the concentration in the membrane is so high that's like a crystal can just scoop them out and build a crystal. And that, in fact, were the first membrane structures, but there are very few of those. All the others, you'd remove the, you have to remove the lipid, and the moment you remove the lipid, you unstructure them to destroy their scaffold, the way they look, because that is not their native environment. So you have to find tricks to go around that. The prediction task, then, would be in a membrane protein to predict, given a sequence, where is the helix, the membrane helix, and another aspect of it, so that then for the entire protein would tell you how many helices you have, and how are they oriented with respect to the inside and outside of the cell. Say this would really be the cell membrane, so the question is, is the begin of the protein here in the outside or on the inside? 
That is important because proteins that belong to certain functional classes, they always have a certain directionality. So the number of membrane helices and the orientation tells you a lot about the function of a protein. This is not the case for globular proteins. If a protein has seven uh, helices or eight, first of all, they don't have an orientation because th there's no inside and outside in the middle of a cell. Uh, secondly, the number of helices in a globular protein is not that important. Here it is. Somehow functional classes are grouped around the uh, number of helices. Why is that the case? It's, it's, we don't know the answer to that question. Ultimately, I guess this is history. Uh, is a trace of history that we see. It evolved that way. So, if we simply, one way, we talked about membrane prediction, uh, helix, secondary structure prediction, so we could just predict secondary structure. We could, the methods that I showed you, since we are talking about helices, why not apply them to this particular task? Uh, are we fully sure that we have only alpha helices in this uh, protein? Sorry? Sorry? In this membrane, uh, the protein which we have are only alpha helices? Are yes. Are we fully sure? Like they can be another or, uh, so what you, let me go back, I'm sorry, uh, I should have made that more clear. So yes, you do have sort of loopy regions here. You have connecting loops, but ultimately the only thing that you will observe in the membrane are helices. There are exceptions, uh, but almost always you see, whenever you see this helical part, uh, and here immediately in this particular protein, again, I told you that sort of the squeezed part and you see the membrane. You see that immediately, right? You don't even need to see the lipid. You can guess it, it's bound or somewhere there, and you see that the part where in fact the, uh, the lipid sits, you have helices in green and yellow here, and then there's just the connecting loop that is going outside. Sometimes you have a little bit of a kink in there that then forms into something that is a local region that is non-regular, that is not really a helix. But mostly in the membrane you only observe helices. There is a different class of proteins that are in the membrane. They have beta strands and we will get to that, uh, I assume, on Thursday. Okay. Any other issue about that? Whoops. Sorry, now we sit with this and it shouldn't have done that. Okay, if I applied the prediction method that I talked about so far, we observe a membrane helix and we predict a beta strand. So it's a completely wrong prediction. The method that predicts helices and proteins that are not membrane bound goes totally wrong. Why do you believe this is? How could that be the case? <coughs> so this method didn't see a lipid, that's true. And the scaffold of the lipid is something that it cannot see. So does that give you some idea what it means if I would take that protein out of the lipid? It would form a beta strand. In fact, in many of these cases, this is exactly what they do. Uh, so we have an example where in some sense you could argue the prediction method is right because it is trained to, to predict the structure in solution. And that is what it correctly predicts. But for this task, absolutely wrong, because you clearly see a membrane helix and, and, and not a, a beta strand. And that is what we try to do. So, um, oh, here we get back into the outside and inside. And why is that the case? Well, so you, you have this image of a scaffold. Ultimately, what it is here that is the lipid bilayer with the head groups here. They stand like this. That is the inside of the membrane here, uh, about for in the ballpark of 2.5 to 3.5 nanometers. Um, so that is like 30 angstrom, by the way. Uh, and so the lipid head groups are here. The lipid head groups here, they are soluble. They are solved in water. The lipid here is not. So that means inside what you have is an environment, so the image of a scaffold is one image, but ultimately what really it's about is hydrophobicity. This inside of the membrane is shielded from water. This inside is such that what you want to have next to you is something that is not water soluble, hydrophobic. Uh, you want to stay, you have some side chains or amino acids that really don't like water. 
that are afraid of water. And that, in fact, is scaffold, what the scaffold is about. You have a hydrophobic environment. You have an environment that is typically the same that you have in the inside. Typically, the protein, I said, is sort of ultimately almost spherical or like a slightly extended sphere. Um, and that is because the part that shows, uh, goes to the, or is, is facing solvent is the hydrophilic part. The part that is facing the inside is hydrophobic. Now, in some sense, we have in the outside, if you want to call this the outside, where the helix is sitting naked. That's where, where you have the environment that typically you have inside of a protein, right? So you completely sort of upside down turn inside and outside in some sense. Typically outside you have solvent and inside you have a hydrophobic environment of touching only amino acids. Now inside you have a hydrophobic uh, 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 lipid environment for hydrophobic residues. Okay, uh, I made that point already. 40% of all the target. Uh, here are some sh uh, voltage gated channels. So here's another example. Now what we, what we show here uh, is a potassium channel. So you, you see the Ki in here. And now actually you look from above. So you look from there, the membrane, you look into the membrane here, and you see that there's a hole into which the, the ion can pass. It's a act, slightly active transport that you see here. In fact, there is a, a chain of ions that sit there and they pass one by one actively through. And then you can immediately see that, in fact, the slight closure of the hole will completely close it. And that you could imagine that this way it is passed here by these two arms that hold it, you can reach a very specific ion passing. So this is 10 times more specific to uh, potassium than, than to any other positively charged iron that is a slightly different size. It's extremely specific for particular substances, which is remarkable if you think about it, by a device that essentially is only mechanical. It's a mechanical switch to distinguish it between minute differences in the size and features of atoms. And that's the way it does it. Well, in principle, here's another way in which in fact, you uh, have membrane proteins do what may be a remarkable thing. Imagine this to be an anchor, this rod. This to be another anchor. We have two membranes, we have two cells. Here, imagine just you put wires, two long wires. These are long helices, typically they are referred to as cold coils. And you twist them. And by twisting these wires, what you see is that you bring the cells close together. And that's exactly what happens in nature. You have an intertwisting of these cold coil regions, and the intertwisting of cold coil regions brings cells, merges in fact membranes of cells. Brings them close, and then there is something else that takes over to really do the merge effect. Uh, but this is just one of those examples, what you do. So here in this particular case, all you need the membrane helix for is an anchor, stability. Pull. This is a different type of protein, or this is a different type of uh, complex. But this is again a membrane, prote membrane proteins that do uh, that do this. Uh, so again, it's an inversion of the regular rule. Hydrophobic now uh, is at the outside, so usually you're inside. Now you want to uh, the solvent is here, and you have water soluble sites on it, uh, and you invert that. And that is essentially the part um, that we have to account for when we predict membrane helices. So some residues are hydrophobic and now what we need to find is residues that are hydrophobic that form um, helices and go through the membrane. One way of trying that is by simply looking at what are the residues that are hydrophobic. So we could come up with a scale, uh, Dave and Eisenberg has done that, uh, a scale that measures hydrophobicity. So that classifies all the 20 amino acids and gives some answer for how hydrophobic they are. So more hydrophobic is here, less hydrophobic is down here. And then you can, for the 20 amino acids, you, uh, look at this scale, the one that I just showed you is the green one here. Uh, and then here you simply have other scales shown. Are they the same? No. Are they correlated? 
Yes, so some of them, so here are uh, residues that are typically considered the hydrophobic residues. All of them are essentially higher here. This is a slightly different scale. Uh, but you do see that they distinguish somehow between hydrophobicity and dot. Now, you could you look at more scales. Uh, now we in fact uh, scale them to values between 0 and 1, where 1 here means very hydrophobic. Um, and you begin to see that there is some confusion going on. So these scales are all supposed to measure something as simple as hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity again, the idea is that you want to measure the degree to which a side chain wants to not be in, in water. And it's a very simple concept, a very simple biophysical concept. You have different scales that reflect that simple concept and you see, you may argue that there's some correlation, but clearly you see a lot of noise or you see a lot of differences, right? Uh, can we cluster them? Here is an answer to that question uh, from about 19 years ago. A Japanese group clustered at that particular point 400 indices, 400 hydrophobicity indices. Uh, and you see there is some cluster of things that in fact are clearly measuring hydrophobicity and they cluster. But there's a lot of other things, other uh, propensities and clearly this idea of hydrophobicity, you look at a side chain, you can say whether that is hydrophobic or not, is not that trivial. All of these are supposed to measure in principle the same thing, they differ quite a lot. But then there's some agreement. Now if there is some agreement, then we could simply go for identifying the hydrophobic residues and see whether they form membrane helices. And see whether we can use that here to correct that mistake that was made by the method that I showed you. Uh, looking at the same region here, uh, hydrophobicity index in this particular one is the first I showed you, the Eisenberg index, uh, would give an age if the index of Heisenberg is above a certain threshold. And you immediately see this clearly maps in this entire sequence region here. The part that is observed as a membrane helix is enriched, enriched in these H, little h's, meaning hydrophobicity. Right? So in some sense, all you need to now do is find a running stretch of little h's and predict a membrane helix. And one of the people who did that first is Gunnar van Heine. Uh, and so there's another trick. So you have to now sort of find the membrane. This is the protein sequence running. Uh, pro this protein has between about 400 residues here. This is the hydrophobicity index per residue. And now what you have to find is a certain running stretch of residues that can form a membrane helix. Now we have the other thing. I, one thing is that everything in the membrane essentially is helical. The other thing is that most helices, and I'm going to give you uh, ex uh, exceptions from that, but most helices go through entirely. Since the membrane is about 25 to 35 angstrom, or 2.5 to 3.5 nanometers, that means the helix has to have a certain length. Otherwise it cannot go through if it is really orthogonal. Uh, so if it is not orthogonal, it has to be a little bit longer. But if it wants to get through, it sort of has to span roughly something that is about 17 residues. And that is exactly where we, so not only do we need to see a segment here that is above some threshold, but the segment above some threshold, if it, want, it has to be a membrane helix, has to have a minimal length. And Gouda, in fact, here has, uses two different thresholds to see whether any of those gets me something into a membrane helix. Okay, so where the higher threshold then would be an onset. I need to have some higher values, otherwise I don't call it membrane helix. But if I just have 14 in the higher value, I extend a little bit more to the lower value. As long as with a lower value, then I get to a number 17. Okay, that's the idea there. Uh, and that is done in some sliding window approach that is formalized here in this paper. Uh, he has another aspect to it, and the other aspect to the original method that he uh, described has to do with the orientation. Um, but let's skip that for a moment. So this way, but so far what we will find is we will identify the membrane helix, but we will not identify the orientation so far, right? So for, if in this particular protein I would see it has three membrane helices, but how could I distinguish whether it's here, the beginning is here, or the beginning is here. 
Any idea? The one outside uh, had to be from not water because uh, it's a full of water. Yes, um, that is absolutely true. But now I made my made a mistake in terms of my slides. In this part, it's a, it's a great answer. Uh, what I should have now is again a f uh, an image of these membrane proteins. Remember this mushroomy thing up there? In the mushroomy thing, you actually have an entire protein domain there. So you actually have something in, in some of those cases that is as globular, as round as any protein, meaning that you have not really the difference between something that is sort of so water soluble. Yes, you have it outside, you have water soluble, inside you don't, and it looks like a regular protein. But uh, you are on to the right idea. Uh, what do you believe? How will the sides differ? They have slightly different pH values. So the environment is slightly different inside and outside. And that should be somehow measurable. The downside to that concept is exactly what I answered you. That uh, when you have many membrane proteins have completely full domains up here and down here, and then you cannot see the distinction really. But if you have sort of hanging out bits, then you might be able to see that. What Guna observed is looking at cytosolic loops, so at these here, so he counts essentially the features of, of the short ones here, cutting out long domains, cutting out this long domain, this long domain, and just looking at the short loops here, here, cutting out this domain in this, in this graph here, and then asks, how many positive residues do I have? And you see that on the membrane side, uh, you have much fewer positively charged residues than on the inside. Red is inside, blue is outside, and you see red is more positive, that's the number of positive residues. The number of positive residues, red is moved towards the right inside. Meaning that in fact, uh, you coined that the positively, positive inside rule, that here you have more positive charges in the loops, not in the entire globular domains, but in sort of hanging bits, you have more positive uh, charges here. If that is the case, then you immediately can use this concept. You can simply predict your helices, count the positive charges at sort of hanging pieces here. Uh, if the hanging pieces are short enough, you count them. If not more than 30 or whatever the threshold is, you will not count in this particular case. So you count uh, all the positive charges here, some five, some two, some three, some one. And then you assign the side. So you count these two here and these two, and you simply say inside is the one with a higher number. As simple as that. And that's the idea of Gunnar. In fact, Gunnar, uh, after he discovered this positive inside rule, he went a step ahead uh, beyond that and simply optimized the placement of the helices such that this number would be optimal. So the difference between inside and outside. That was one of his ideas. Um, here's another idea. Uh, from the white group, the argument here is one way in which we can look at it is the way I described to you. We want to have hydrophobic residues in order to identify membrane helices. Why not turn this upside down? Why not just look at membrane helices and argue membrane helices are correctly evolved for the environment, hence let's find the scale that describes best the set of observed residues in membrane helices. In some sense, if you want, this is like a machine learning of the membrane environment, the membrane scaffold in some sense. And that is the idea here uh, to, in fact, correct that uh, prediction by bringing a, a, a scale that's specific to membrane helices. Another way of doing it is getting back to that method here that I described to you, used globular secondary structure, predicted globular secondary structure by, by learning from globular proteins. Globular are proteins that are not membrane bound. Okay, uh, so how could we reshape that method to treat membrane proteins? Simply, 
Hmm? We can train it. Exactly, we could train on membrane proteins. So the few, okay, we have few experimental structures. We have some, however, we could use them, and then we do exactly the same thing. You may remember that the major signal here was the evolutionary signal. You may, may remember there was a sh first level network that was produced a little bit too short helices, and then there was a second level network that made the helices longer. So you can do all of that and come up with a new method. Now there is something else that you need to do, some additional thing. In a, globular proteins have, f about 50% of the residues are either helices or beta strand. And you predict the helices and the strands and that essentially is the end of the, of the day. For membrane proteins, you want to know is it a membrane protein or not. In some sense, that means that if you, for instance here, have a residue number running, this, the potential for non-membrane and the potential for membrane here, uh, they are inverse of one another, you may observe. So this is one minus that, or the other way around. Uh, so essentially now you have to simply see, is this compatible with the idea that the protein has at least one helix or not? And then you introduce, it's a hack, uh, and you introduce a certain threshold and say, if so, then yes, it's a membrane protein. Then you take, in fact, now here's another idea, um, and I'm obviously skipping over that. Um, so I said that the first level where input is sequence, output is typically regular secondary structure, in this case it would be helix mem helical membrane or not, uh, that typically what it does is he the predicted helices are too short. Typically predicted helices in globular proteins are 10 residues. For membrane proteins, I already told you there should be 17 and longer, typically. Uh, so by then putting in the prediction into the second level, that in fact sees, sees only the helix prediction and comes out with helices again to see correlation between adjacent residues, that is the idea of the second level. Uh, and for globular proteins, this worked very well, and I told you that in fact the helices that predicts are on average looking exactly like the observed ones as a distribution. For membrane proteins, unfortunately, this works too well, in the sense that now what comes out here is twice as long on average, or, or much, much longer on average than actual membrane helices. When it's twice as long, it's easy, right? What you, so a typical membrane helix is 17 residues. Uh, if I predict one that is 34, what do I do? I cut it, and I assume that rather than, since I have not observed membrane helices that are 34 residues long, I assume it's just two. And all that, I, my, my prediction method simply doesn't see the kink. And that may be uh, because the kink in fact is it would form a long membrane helix, but it is energetically so unfavorable that it's actually inserted back into the membrane. That's the simple reason. So again, the prediction method may actually be right. Uh, but so you would have a simple hack. That's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it is you perceive this as an energy landscape and you find the optimal path through that energy landscape. So let's just look at it. If you want to find a membrane helix that is 17 residues long, or about 17, so you have some window between, say, 15 and 25, uh, so you want to find the one membrane helix between 15 and, and 25 that has the highest signal in this energy landscape per residue. How would you do that? Totally easy, yes. So? So, there are many algorithms for that. Are you looking for a particular algorithm? How would you do it? It's a totally easy, you're absolutely right. <laughs> but how would you do it? Maybe uh, mountain climbing or some. Yes, but so again, remember, what we're talking about is a protein that is maybe 400 or 500 residues long. It can be even simpler than mountain climbing. You can enumerate them. You can just essentially enumerate all possible fragments that fit on. Uh, if you know it has to be 15 to 25. It's a, it's a very small space, search space here. You don't even have to really optimize. You can essentially count the whole thing. Now we get into a slight optimization problem. So for the first one, 
is very easy. You, you enumerate all the segments that, that fit into that criteria. So for every single fragment between 17 or 15 and 25, you simply look up what's the per residue number, and then you find the top. Now, if you want, if you believe the protein has two membrane helices, you find the second best. Now you have a slight issue. Second best cannot overlap with the first. So you that's another hack. Uh, once you solve that hack, uh, essentially, so that's what I mean here, if you have one, then the highest one would in this particular case be that one here. If the second one comes in, the second highest would be the 9-3, the highest is 9-5, the second one is 9-3, but that overlaps. So I cannot take that, and since that was the, the first highest, I stick with that fragment here, this one. Uh, so the second highest, not including the overlap one, would then be this. So if the protein has two, the best solution for two is this. Okay? And that's a hack. But uh, it's a fairly okay hack. Why is it a hack? Why is it not strictly true what I'm saying? Because I'm not going back and asking, well, maybe the combination of these two, actually the longer one would have been right. I assume that at every single step what I did was best. By doing the next step, what was best in the previous one, what is best for both of them may change. And that is what I'm not checking again, simply because of speed. Uh, because that will then actually explode my complexity a little bit. Uh, but as long as I assume this, the, the, the best guess is the best way or the good way to do it, and that whatever I got me here was right, and then at the next one is a totally trivial algorithm. Uh, very, very fast. And then again, at the end, I simply assign the orientation according to the numbers that I look in between. Positive inside rule. And in this particular case, the method would predict this. So turn something that was entirely incorrectly predicted into something that is entirely correctly predicted. Um, now, I briefly introduced hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models are great when it comes to grammar. So when it comes to rules that have to do with something that is uh, repetition. And that is exactly the kind of scenario we have here. We have this scenario where we have an outside, we have a membrane inside, uh, we have another outside, so we have different cytoplasmic side, non-cytoplasmic side. What I show here is TMM, uh, a tool that comes from Eric Sonheimer, Anna Koch initially came, had this idea. Uh, in fact, Anash was the one, some of you may, may remember, who introduced the hidden Markov models into alignment methods. Uh, here now it was the first time it was used to predict uh, membrane proteins in this particular case in 2001, but the first approach was earlier. Anyway, so again, you have two different sides of the membrane with slightly different uh, environments. You have a helix core, and all of this is exactly, let's call it grammar. All of this you can easily put into a hidden Markov model that goes from globular to loop on a cytoplasmic light. Cytoplasmic side has a cap, so the end, that is the cytoplasmic loop, goes into a helix core, goes into cap on the non-cytoplasmic side, the outside, and then either goes into a long loop or in a short loop, and then goes back, or it goes into an entire globular domain. Very simple model, and do you remember how to set up hidden Markov models? What do you have to do now? In order, so this is just you know a few drawings on the whiteboard. What do you have to do in order to fill it with life? You have to assign the probability, the transition probability for a given sequence. So observing a particular sequence, what's the probability from at one point in the sequence to go into that or that direction? Or, uh, in this one here, it's a loop. This one is a clear directionality. Uh, go, continue going or go into the cap state. Uh, this, there should be a loop back here. There's a mistake in the drawing. Uh, and that depends on the probabilities. How do you set these probabilities? Sorry? Odds yes, you simply look at the odds for the proteins that I have observed uh, and run the algorithm. Here is a similar concept using HMM uh, from a Hungarian group, Ishvan Shibon is the developer here, or the main group developer. Um, 
and the difference now essentially here is in the way you model the inside of these modules and that again so they use the same structures but you could have more substructure if you want and that's what they do here when will it pay off to have more substructure when will it pay off to have more detail when will it pay off to have less detail any idea what that depends on determine the function of the protein? That is true. Uh, it's a great point. So then you would, in, let's just make it in the most extreme case, you would add a completely new element to it or a new module to it. Uh, but there's something else. What could prevent you from, let's, let's turn it around, what could prevent you from adding more detail? If a protein is too long, it would prevent you from adding more detail. Is that what you're arguing? Maybe it will be, become too expensive or too long. So, in terms of the simulation. So, the simulation, in fact, to train the uh, hidden Markov model here takes some time, but it's doable. To run it, given a sequence, is totally trivial. Once you have the probabilities assigned, to find the particular solution for that one, is that now having two or three membrane helices is easy. The running part, tightening, we could not run with it. You're right on that. So very long ones we could not run. But there, there is something that is actually another problem. Remember, all of these substructures here are per free per introduce free parameters. And if I don't have enough data to fill these free parameters, then I may get with too much detailed substructure into trouble. It may work, but it may not work. And here's the second reason why. Uh, so firstly, clearly we, it would be better to have more data for more substructure. The other thing is, maybe the substructure is not supported. So, whether or not there is a particular signal in the end of a membrane helix, in the cap, depends on how much the membrane helix can actually move. If the helix could move easily, a little bit up and down, then that particular end would not be very well defined. And then no matter how much data you have, you will in fact not have a well defined scenario. Right? But, so essentially, whenever you look for more detail, the two questions are, is that supported by the problem? And is it supported by the data? And that is, again, is true. I'm showing it here for, mem for uh, bring up this issue here for membrane proteins. But it has nothing to do with computational biology. As a generic problem, it's only always very, very difficult to answer these two questions. And typically, the only way to answer them is you try and see uh, whether it works. What's the criterion for it works, do you believe? In an, in an environment, any environment in which you apply that in the future, uh, now you want to add substructure. What would you have to encounter in order to say, okay, it didn't work? So you build a model to simulate uh, the odds of a cer certain uh, party winning some final game. Barca winning uh, against Juventus or something like that. So you have a, you have a model that predicts the probability of uh, Barcelona winning. Uh, and the model does not say Barcelona always wins. This gets a high accuracy, I understand that. But uh, we want to refine from there. So how, how can you see whether more substructure so more substructure could be a particular player is on the, on the field or not. How could you see whether that works? Validation. Do the validation on the existing... Uh, on the existing data. Mm -hmm. So you could, that's a great idea. So you essentially, for the existing data, you ask uh, Neymar on the field or not, is that actually making a difference? So I have winning, losing, uh, and, and draws, and is the Neymar equally distributed between the three? That's an easy way of doing it. Uh, that, in fact, that is a way of doing it before you ever do the prediction method. The, once you have the prediction method, you could also see, does it improve? So is actually this particular sub-model that you have, does it lead to a higher accuracy? or? If it actually is neutral in terms of accuracy, does it lead to a faster overtraining?
And then possibly you may at that point already be in overtraining mode. So stay away from it. Those are ways of, of, of handling it. Look at overtraining, look at the performance. I will get back to the performance of membrane helix prediction. Um, and in fact, Jonas will get back to that on Thursday. Uh, so I skip this slide. Um, now, let's just uh, have a different look at it. The different look at it will now be when I look at an entire organism, what fraction of the organism is in the membrane? One point that I should have made more clear here, I told you that experimental structure determination for membrane proteins is difficult. What I did not say is about 1% of all the known structures are membrane proteins, 1%. What do you believe the, the, the fraction of membrane proteins in a cell is? It must be higher than 1%. Otherwise, I would not have said it's an underrepresentation, right? Any idea? I said more than more than 50, more than half. Uh, so you're not that far off, uh, less than a factor of two. So eukaryotes, uh, prokaryotes down here, bacteria, archaea. Uh, and you see that roughly all of those have in the ballpark of 15 to 30 percent of their proteins in the membrane. What is a remarkable outcome here, in fact, for many years, textbooks uh, argued that eukaryotes would have way more membrane proteins than prokaryotes. And the reason for that was that eukaryotes have a more complex structure of handling signals. And since membrane proteins are sort of the signal entry point, that is the way you could see handling more complex scenarios. Turns out it's not true. Uh, As I already told you, the length difference between archaea or prokaryotes and eukaryotes is also not true. As the amino acid composition between archaea, uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes is similar. So essentially what, what you see here is the percentage of this particular amino acid used in bacteria, eukaryotes, archaea. And you see it's essentially similar, right? Uh, the distribution. As is the family size, let's not get into the detail, uh, membrane proteins, all of these are very similar. Um, so we don't have this issue of more transmembrane helices is more complexity. But there still is an issue that has to do with this, the number. And now it gets complicated again, I'm sorry. So what I show here is number of membrane helices predicted. And I distinguish between white, they face inside, and black, they fit outside. And I have different organisms here. This, for instance, E. coli, this is the fly, this is human. And even at that resolution of my, my graph, what you can possibly immediately appreciate is that there are differences. So while it is true that overall 30% or 15 to 30% of all the proteins are in the membrane for all of these organisms, some of them human for instance, have a lot in one particular position. That's seven. That's a black seven here. And you do not see this peak of black seven for all of the other. For none of the others you actually see it. Uh, so that's a particular class of proteins. In fact, most of the drug targets are exactly these proteins here. Uh, G-coupled receptors. Uh, while other organisms, as bacteria, for instance, have peaks here in, in uh, for instance, six and, and 12 that eukaryotes absolutely don't have here. There's the six is empty, the 12 is, is essentially empty, uh, and that is high here. And that is what I said, the number of transmembrane helices and the orientation has a lot to do with a particular functional detail. And it's very organism or, or, or kingdom specific in some sense. Bacteria have different makeup. But overall, the number of proteins are similar. Uh, let's, let's skip these. Um, uh, that is, the, by the way, in, just in the background, uh, about 15 to 30 percent or 35 percent is membrane proteins. Uh, about 15 to 20 something percent is secreted proteins. So these are proteins that are outside. 
And again, you see that is uh, here the number is zero because I should have a, a strike through. The method did not, could not predict this. This is not that there is none here, that is an inability of the method to predict it. While in these cases here, the, call call, uh, the nuclear proteins are not existing uh, because prokaryotes don't have nucleus. Uh, and the nuclear you see, nucleus is, you see in the ballpark of 15%. So 15% nucleus, 15% outside, and 20 something percent uh, membrane proteins. And some, somehow this is a coarse grained makeup of a cell. Uh, okay, so again, we have about 1%, 20% of all the proteins are membrane proteins, about 50% of the drug targets are membrane proteins, but only 1% of the structures. And that, in fact, creates the background at which membrane prediction is so important. Because you cannot get the structures, you want to have uh, the structures because they're important financially, they're important for uh, health, they're important to advance in certain ways, and you can't hardly get at them. Um, okay, now there are, by the way, um, about 107 families. Um, at this point we have about a thousand unique membrane, or this is higher now, a thousand unique membrane structures. I'm going to give you a couple of problems, additional problems in the membrane prediction, and some of these slides come from Arne Elofsson, who you see here at his wedding. And Climbing. Uh, so the first issue here is can we in fact since we have and again this is the membrane helix here this is the outside part in this particular case uh, can we find ways to have sort of predict interface helices interface helices shown here in red um, they are typically fairly short nine amino acids sometimes up to 19 uh, they're most frequent, he says, in the photosynthetic reaction center, but that is true for the set of known structures. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still the case today. Uh, but many contain some sort of helix like that. You could imagine it like a lid, that you sort of create this pore and there's something on top of it to close it. In some cases, that really is a lid. Uh, it is a helix that swarms on top. So that is one, one issue. Now, why could that confuse our membrane prediction? Because these lids, in fact, are helices that are very hydrophobic. In fact, they sit partially or sometimes entirely in the helix, in the membrane. In this particular case, they sit orthogonal and they can go in and out. Uh, but they have a lot of the features of a membrane helix, but they are not passing. So in this particular case here, assume they would be close in sequence. Then all you need to, to assume is that they, they, these two are joining, and rather than seeing that, in fact, you have two interface helices, you would predict it as one membrane helix. And predict this as one membrane helix would be twice wrong. You would be wrong in the number, and you would be wrong in the orientation, because suddenly the inside-outside counting would totally go off. Um, so that is one issue. The other issue is related is re-entry helices. Uh, and 10 years ago, we had seen essentially very few of those, or oh, this is actually, um, I'm not right, more than 10 years ago, he already saw the first. Uh, they ha ten, nine years ago, he had seen 36. 20 years ago, we had not seen a single one. Now we know many, many more. Again, this blue mesh here is supposed to be the end of the lipid bilayer. The same here, those are the membrane helices. And you see an example where, in fact, you have a helix that goes in and comes out again. Same here. Into the uh, lipid and out again. And these two almost touch. So in terms of the way the membrane helix is built up, it has, you have essentially the same biophysics as a long membrane, uh, a long helix, but you form it from two pieces. And in this particular case here is a violation to what I said. Uh, you have now loops that connect you back out. Okay? So here we have examples where in the membrane we have something that is not a helix, uh, not a beta strand. Um, again, so the length, some of these are very, very short. Some of them are fairly long. 
that's another problem to uh, predict. Now, and here, here's an example how they sit. So in this particular example is where you see it's almost like a long helix continuing. Here you just see it's two parts of a helix that is almost broken. And so it's, it's like this long finger that would go through as a nice membrane helix, but instead it suddenly goes back. Which again is something that is very difficult to, or very easy to fool a membrane prediction method because you would have a helix that looks exactly the same length, exactly the same features, totally hydrophobic, uh, and could easily go through. If you don't recognize that kink, you will get the wrong prediction. Um, and how could we predict these reentry helices? Well, you already saw that essentially this is a model that is a hidden Markov model. What's the challenge? So one, obviously, is what I've been indicating that they look very similar to other helices. So if you look very, it's, it's, it's very difficult to distinguish two things that are very similar. They have the same biophysical constraints. They essentially have a similar way of operating, uh, operating as in biophysics again. Uh, so very difficult to distinguish from sequence alone. But there's another machine learning challenge. Remember the numbers I put on the whiteboard? Hmm? Yeah, it's very less Yes, very, very, very few. So we have 30, in those days when he did his first model, uh, we had 36. 36 of these CDCs, and they range from 30 to 32 residues. So this is 36 times uh, less than 30 samples, even on an individual residue base. Ah, that's a tiny number, just barely a thousand. So you cannot optimize many parameters with that. Uh, not optimizing many parameters, by the way, uh, here are the uh, this is now the result of a prediction method. And in a prediction method, you in fact predict there should be many, 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 many more proteins that have them. So we have only 36 observed, but he believes that in 4,000 human proteins you would have one of these reentry regions. Um, can you trust that? So you start with 36 as a small number, and it's very easy to say no. We cannot trust this because the number is too small. Uh, and these estimates are so far away from what we have observed. So it may be totally wrong. But then it may also be totally right. What could you do to sort of increase your belief that what you do is right? Well, let me, put it, let me phrase the problem differently. Let's get back to the number game here. You have a problem. Uh, and you need a solution for that problem. And you have very few numbers. How can you dare to approach the problem, the problem without overfitting? So I'm, I'm falling into this issue with noise between noise and, and air in the room. What could you do? It's yes, that's the danger, but how can you avoid that? What could you do so that you reduce the odds of oversampling as much as you can? Simplify your model. What does it mean, simplify the model? Essentially, come up with a model or the solution that has as few parameters as possible. Um, and that is, again, is a design matter. You could just say, okay, uh, I have a set of, of residues, I have one parameter, and I, I s well, actually, let's go, if, if I would look at the amino acid composition, so which residues are used in that helix, that already is too much, maybe. It's 20 parameters. So I have to come up with a model that is somehow simpler than that. Uh, what is somehow simpler than that? Well, you could possibly argue, um, there is one particular type of residue. So here would be the bingo ex example. There's one particular type of amino acid that makes this kind of turn. And you find that one. Then you have one parameter. That could go. 
But again, I believe what I'm trying to raise here is the awareness in an environment where you have very few parameters, you have two options. One is just say I can't do, another one is to be very careful in the way you build the model. Now the real challenge is that you know, we have a problem here. We have something that obviously nature finds a way to do it. Uh, we don't understand how and it's very difficult for us to understand how nature does that and that typically is describing a problem that is not easily solved with one free parameter. But typically all I described here are aspects that typically call for a much more fine-grained model but we don't have the parameters to fill the fine-grained model and this is why in situations like that mostly people just who understand enough um, about machine learning or, or fitting stay away from it. But again, we have an example here where we have uh, strong pressure and then ultimately all you can do is be as careful as possible with the data. Hope that by the time you have finished your project there is new data out there that helps you to estimate how much overestimate you possibly put into your method uh, and possibly allows you to, to go back. Uh, there have, has not been a lot of new work on this. Um, and this is to some extent because, not because of these numbers, but to some extent because uh, I guess the problem is really a complicated one. Um, now, the other issue pertains to more recent structures that we have seen. Uh, I answered that essentially everything in the membrane is a helix and that mostly membrane helices are orthogonal to the membrane. That's the, the standard issue. I, now we have seen all kinds of issues that sort of invalidate what I said. One, these interface helices that hang out a little bit, the reentrance helices that come back and uh, out and back. Uh, and then, the, oops, sorry. Uh, here's another issue, the issue of the angles. So many helices, so this one here is a reentrant helix. This is in fact, uh, a helix with a very strange angle. This green one here is not re-entering. It really is going through, but it's going through as something that is not really helical anymore here. Uh, here we have a helix that is at a very different than orthogonal angle. This is important because there you can no longer say that it is 17 residues. At a 45 degree angle, this is uh, much, much more than that, at least a third more, right? Uh, so methods that try the algorithm that I told you before, that try to optimize the, the between tw uh, 15 and 25, if you now suddenly have a, a 35 residue, I said hack cut in half, but here it's no longer true. Here we have another issue that is something that is, has been observed more and more often actually, where you have a membrane helix that is a nice membrane helix, but it actually sticks in the core of a protein. We get back to the issue, the core of a protein is hydrophobic. To stick a, hyd uh, a hydrophobic helix into the core is energetically perfectly feasible because it's the same thing as the lipid. So why in some proteins do you have this, this, this thing stick in the center or not is, remains a puzzle to us. Uh, Gunnar van Heine again has a seen examples and that may have been this particular protein, I can't remember which, uh, in which changing the environmental conditions slightly pushed this helix out into the membrane. So he had, they had seen one structure in which the helix was inside of the core of, of the protein. And another one in slightly different conditions when this, in fact, that was predicted to be a nice membrane helix was inserted as a nice membrane helix. Again, the question now becomes, which, is that a prediction mistake? Well, we cannot see the environment. Uh, in some cases, it is a prediction mistake, and we have to distinguish between things that really sit in the membrane and things that look like a membrane helix and sit inside of the protein. Um, but that makes it more complicated for prediction method. Another idea uh, introduced by by several at the same time, this is the publication from uh, Arne Elofsson, is the idea of a z-coordinate. So the z-coordinate, essentially, again, I told you that the lipid bilayer, the membrane, is formed by two lipids facing each other. And since you have two lipids facing each other, you can already suspect that there will be sort of a difference. 
whether you're between the environment in the center of the lipid, okay, it's all hydrophobic. But there's a slight difference here at the center and closer to the surface. And maybe then this could be sensed. Maybe you can in fact predict the difference between a hydrophobic helical residue that sits more at the end and a hydrophobic residue that sits sort of in the center of two lipids. Um, what this one here shows is that sometimes uh, the, the method that predicts it does do the prediction fairly right and that you can in fact sometimes distinguish between the degree to which you are in the center. Where again, the way you train that is you use data that labels residues according to this Z coordinate. The problem with that here is that now we also have a problem where the experimental data is not well defined. I said we don't see the lipid. Not seeing the lipid means that you sort of can move around a little bit here. It's, your experimental information is not clearly telling you uh, is the zero here or here or here. So that m immediately makes the data that you use in order to train systems here inaccurate. Right? And that is one of the issues. Uh, if not the major issue behind here. Yeah? Aren't uh, protein unique a little bit inside? So the remarkable reality is that the if that is now my lipid, uh, the degree to which you can do this is very limited. I talked about this helix that was pushed back. That is a big exception. Usually proteins don't move in that direction. But you can easily move in that direction. So in fact, you can move the th whole thing through the membrane very, very easily. But in that direction you cannot. So the, in that sense, the z-axis, or the, what is this graph introduced here as a z-axis, uh, is well defined, biophysically remarkably. Uh, but again, so the problem really is the labeling, the correct labeling of the data. We are at the end of today's lecture. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to talk about, uh, so Jonas is going to talk a little bit about how good membrane prediction methods work. Uh, and then I will go on and talk about beta membrane prediction uh, and get then into the prediction of solvent accessibility. Um, then we get into disorder prediction and then we get into contact prediction. Thanks for your attention. Any questions?